Good afternoon, uh, colleagues, um, and welcome to what is now our third in the webinar series called The Clumsy Conversations. And uh, we have a very interesting topic today. Uh, we will be sharing with you many interesting things still over this next year in terms of key topics within the transformation agenda. And today we have a very interesting topic here today, whiteness, which um, Dr. Ann Crawford uh, from Pretoria University will be sharing with us. I'm certainly looking forward to engage this conversation and looking forward to Ann, uh, you telling us all about it and uh, invite everybody later on to engage the conversation uh, because our conversation within the clumsy webinars is about people participating. So please do join in and welcome again. Uh, over to you, Anne. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, just, a, just a summary of um, what, what, the, what the clumsy conversations are about. Um, so we're going to be addressing um, issues related to critical transformation. But, but the aim of the, the webinar is to very much adopt a conversational style um, rather than any sort of finality. Um, and very importantly, just ensuring a psychological, safe, yet authentic conversation space. Um, so the format of, of the webinar, um, I will provide an introduction to the topic for about 15 minutes. Um, Andrew, can I ask that you'll just watch my time? Um, and then the, we'll open it up to the plenary where we will discuss the issues that are raised and any other issues need to be. And then we will have key learnings and a summary for about five minutes. Now, I've entitled my, my particular webinar, The Theory of the Room, Whiteness, The Theory of the Room. And it comes from the quote that Andrew used, I think, in his first and the second um, of the Clumsy Conversations um, from Nalba Marquez Green, which says that white supremacy is not the elephant in the room. It is the room. Um, and I think that sums it up really, really nicely. And so I think we can quite confidently call whiteness the theory of the room. And hopefully as, as, we, as I go through, um, it will become a little clearer as to, to why that is the case. Now, whiteness, um, or whiteness means three things. So according to Frankenberg, was one of the first authors who started working in the field, um, and she looked particularly at whiteness in white women in the United States of America. And, and she said that it means three things. The first one is that it's a location of racial privilege, which is entrenched in social structures. Now I'm going to unpack each one of these, but I think what's important here is that whiteness is structural. It's not just, it's not just racism. It is actually physically entrenched in structures, which makes it very difficult to just go away um, because anything that's structural is very difficult to change by the nature of it. Secondly, whiteness is a standpoint from which white people consider themselves and others in society. And, and that speaks of a lens. It's a way of looking at the world. It's, it's a way of being socialized, which becomes normalized um, and assumed to be given. Um, and that speaks to the relationship between white people and, and others in society. And then the third thing that whiteness means is that it's a set of cultural practices. Um, which means that it's a given way of doing things. If we, if we think of culture as the way we do things around here. Um, but these cultural practices are unmarked and unnamed, which makes it very, very difficult to actually change them or to do anything about them because they become normalized to the point it's becoming um, result in a place of power and privilege. Um, and, but it's very important to realize that when we talk about whiteness, it's not something that can exist on its own, that whiteness is inherently relational and it can only exist by relying or being in relationship with the other, which in most instances is the stigmatized um, body of color. And, and so for whiteness to get its meaning and definition, it relies on blackness, if I may use that term. 
Now, if we just go and unpack those those um, different elements that Frankenberg talks about, and in in talking, I'm I'm, I'm just going to um, sort of uh, give a disclaimer that a, a lot of my focus, I'm going to focus specifically on South Africa. Whiteness is not necessarily a South African issue. We talk about international whiteness, which is something that is um, occurs across the world. It's 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 built into to global structures. Um, but my own research has been very much in South Africa, and and so I can speak more authoritatively about about um, South Africa. So I'm going to focus very much on on South Africa. So um, the first thing we said is that whiteness is structural and spatial. Now I'll go and look at the spatial element in a little while. Um, but as I said, because it is structural, it's very difficult to pin down. It's easy to turn around and say to somebody, you racist, um, because it's, it's something blatant, it's something there, it's something visible, it's something obvious. But, but whiteness is, is built into our structures, the way society is structured, and the, the cultural practices around which society is structured. Um, and so it's built into things like educational structures, it's built into the living areas, that if we think of how we as many, most South Africans live, um, uh, it's built into organizations, it's built into work, it's built into professions. Um, and so that is where I'm going to sort of highlight more. And, and the professions that I have specifically looked at in terms of whiteness and the impact on professional identity of, of people, of professionals of color, is engineering, accounting, and psychology. Um, and What's important is if we go and look at the history of those professions, um, engineering and accounting started when with the, the discovery of gold and diamonds, well, first diamonds and then gold um, in South Africa, which was 1867 and then again 1886. Um, and psychology was the, the first independent psychology department was in first people of color um, and African people specifically um, into the profession. It's 80, 40 to 80 years later in terms of the way that profession has been structured. So for 60 to 80, uh, 80 to 40 to 80 years, it was structured in ways of being white. Um, so for example, Esli Fakani was the first civil engineer to, to study at WITS. Um, that was 1960. Prof Wiseman, Wiseman and Kula was the first accountant, 1976. And then Noel Chibani Manganya was the first psychologist. Now, interestingly enough, when, when Noel Chibani, Chibani Manganya actually was looking for an internship, if you talk about structures, there was no place for him. There was no structure for him to do his internship because the way the profession was structured, there was nowhere for him to go. Fortunately, he found a psychologist, I mean, a psychiatrist who was willing to take him under his wing um, and so provide him with, with, with an internship. But just that speaks to the way professions are structured. The next element about whiteness is the fact that it's a lens. Um, and so if we go and look at the whole notion of race and the way people have been racialized. So we think often tend to think of race and particularly in South Africa, because we've had these four boxes that you have to fit into and that was regulated um, very, very carefully. But um, it's historically, it's a very new thing and that people have been racialized. So when we talk about whites and coloreds and Indians and blacks, which we generally do in South Africa, we have to realize that is a lens that has been developed over time. Um, and within that mix, particularly white superior superiority. And that was developed in the context of colonialism and slavery as a means to justify racial domination. But that lens over time, over the last 300 years, has become so entrenched and so normalized that white people no longer look at it as, as or recognizes it as anything but normalized. And then the last element there are the cultural practices. So if we go and look at the, in, in organizations and professions and society at large, but again, I'm focusing on uh, organization and work. The languages that are spoken in organizations, um, the signs and symbols, um, art. Um, one of the, the um, a colleague at, at Tux says, 
it was just explained to me how as, as, a, as an African woman, she's so uncomfortable with a lot of the art on the walls because a lot of the art on the walls is of bare-breasted African women and, and, and how she has to, in that space, um, try and create space for absolutely alienating um and then obviously in terms of theater cultural literature religion and faith related practices um and then in then sport as well um now some scholars have actually cautioned against focusing study on white people because the logic is um because white people are already dominant and they're already in a position of privilege why do we want to study them more? Why do we want to add more focus onto them? But Bell Hooks suggests that only a persistent, rigorous, and informed critique of whiteness can really determine what forces of denial, fear, and competition are responsible for creating fundamental gaps between professed political commitment to eradicating racism and the participation in the construction of a discourse on race that perpetuates racial domination. Um, and so we see this area of whiteness coming into to being to tackle this um, space between open racism and the fact that the things never ever seem to change, that there's this, this, this professed um, need to change things, but the fact that things never change. And that lies in the privilege that white people have and our resistance and our fear of, of letting that go. Now, um, I'll, 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 um, I'll have done a lot of work in, in the area of whiteness. Kurt April, um, who's, a, who's a South African academic at UCT, was also part of, of the study. And they suggest that whiteness can be studied um, in five key areas, um, history space, and then the levels of macro, meso, and micro. Now, macro obviously speaks to international whiteness. Um, and depending on, on the nature of the study, you can pitch those at different levels. But the two that I want to focus on today are specifically history and space, because I think they are probably the most important. And obviously, with time constraints, um, we are just going to look at whiteness as historical. And I just want to focus on. Hi, hi South Anne. Africa. Sorry. Sorry, Anne. Yes. Um, Maybe yes. you want to switch off your video because the bandwidth is uh, creating oh, a little okay. bit of a lag. Okay. Okay, is that better? Yeah, much better. Okay, that's perfect. Sorry, I didn't realize that was creating a problem. Okay, um, so if, if we go and think of, of whiteness as historical, that from an international context, as I said, um, it originates in the whole idea of slavery and colonialism. But if we go and look at at whiteness in South Africa, because, because one of the things about whiteness is that it is contextual. And so we always need to understand whiteness in its context, because the way it manifests and the way it is produced in different contexts um, varies. And so it's important to understand whiteness in a given context. Um, and and in, in the research that I did, I wrote it up, I've written it up in, in a book. And, and in the um, literature chapters, in the introductory chapter, I started off by just creating a context for South African whiteness and for South Africa, the, the structural privilege that, that white people have. Um, and, and I did that by looking at the history or, or the laws, the legislation, the colonial and then the apartheid legislation that was aimed at, at people of color. Now, the, the, the list that the four slides, and I'm, I'm not going to go through them all, I'm just going to list, I'm just going to sort of page through them so you can just get a sense of how extensive it is. These just focus on legislation related to work and employment. They don't deal with mixed marriages or, or any other, this question of communism, nothing of that. This just relates to work. And as you can see, for between 1911, 1911 and um, 1927, we have all these um, acts which serve to deny um, people of color in our country um the, the right to work um it, the right to to be part of a union um the, 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 the 
pensioned, it, it forced people to live in certain areas. Um, it, absolutely every area of, of, of people of color's lives were, were regulated and put them in a place where it was very, very difficult to create a life for yourself. And it entrenched a system of privilege, which unfortunately today uh, continues to be perpetuated. Now, the next element, I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to be five more minutes. Um, the next element is whiteness is spatial. Um, and I just want to take a quote here from Millie and Senora. Um, Places take on a life of their own, with certain groups able to superimpose their presence on others. In the entangled nature of people's lives, places on this account take shape through dominant or controlling rhythms that seek to suppress the routine traces of others. Exclusion in this context has less to do with closed doors and high walls and rather more to do with spaces constructed by dominant groups in their own likeness through a series of rituals and gestures, moods and attachments, as well as accumulated styles and meanings. And I think this is, is, is very, very important because we often, um, the, the, the argument is often made, well, people of color are not prevented from coming into the organization. We open our doors, we welcome people in. But what is never taken into account is that the space in which those people have to come in is thoroughly white. It is habited, inhabited, permeated through the, 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 the dominant controlling rhythms, through the gestures, through the moods, the attachments, the art, the other things I mentioned um, are alien in, in that sense. And what, what as white people, we don't always realize is we take that for granted. That is normal to us. Um, but it is a world that is comfortable for us, but that is not necessarily the people. If we just go and look at a couple of, of, of elements related to whiteness as spatial. Um, firstly, we can never understand whiteness um, without taking into account geography and space. Um, because as Lefebvre uh, points out, social relations are always happen in a space. We, we cannot consider social relations outside of space. And if we're going to look traditionally at the, the, the history of psychology, it's very much about the mind. We don't really think about space. We don't really think about areas and where social relations exist, but we have to take them into account if we want to understand the nature of social relations. Um, now, space is obviously linked to temporality, time and history, and who is traditionally played in that space. Um, so embodied performances over time result in some spaces coming to be donated as white and taking on the qualities of the bodies that have inhabited them. And I've just added some of the theorists who work in that space. So this is not just one person who sort of come up with this idea. This is a, a, a body of work that has been done on, on the relationship between um, whiteness and space. Um, and because of those embodied performances over time, white people become the natural occupants of the space and bodies of color are therefore more noticeable. And if we go and think of the way that manifests in organizations, um, there is the idea of what constitutes professional hair, what constitutes professional clothes. If we go and look at greetings, one of the, the guys in the research we did said um, the way he's forced to greet in organizations is so different to um, the way he greets in his culture, where he would greet Sis Pearl or Ma so-and-so. All of a sudden, it's way of interacting. Um, the cultural practices, um, we, in, in, in a lot of our work organizations, and this comes also obviously from international whiteness, um, the idea of constantly being able to challenge authority, whereas many cultures in our country, deference is, is the preferred option. Um, if we go and think of uh, the kind of um, functions at organizations, the music that, that is played, the food that is served, the themes of those functions, um, and then also the dominant lifestyle entertainment of, of people in those organizations. All of those is that unmarked, invisible culture that is very obvious to everybody else. 
but to white people, it can be, um, it's so normalized that we don't see that it is actually foreign to other people. And then I just want to, to end with a quote. And interestingly, this comes from Zora Neale, Zora Neale Hurston, who wrote this in 1928. I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. And I think that is the experience of so many people of color moving into organizations um, that are traditionally, and I say traditionally in inverted commas, that have come to be structured in ways that are white and that have taken on the rhythms of the white body. And thank you very much. That's all I have to say right now. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks very much, Anne. That was really nicely done. <clears throat> Brief key points that came out. Uh, whiteness being spatial, that's a very interesting one for me. And this quote by uh, this guy from 1928 is just quite amazing. I think Rob commented on that too that he said something like that in 1928, you know, and it's uh, relevance to us right now, how uh, we find ourselves against that, uh, you know, backdrop of whiteness and how we stand out so much more because of that. Uh, really nice piece here. Thanks very much, Anne, for that information. <clears throat> My task is not to summarize what Anne has said. What we are about here is a discussion, give us some thoughts, some key points, things, uh, a lot of things to think about, reflect on, and then to jump into the conversation. And uh, so colleagues, I really invite you to jump into that conversation. And uh, Rob was, uh, I was going to comment uh, Rob that uh, I saw two questions coming out of you, but maybe you can relate it. The first one had to do with, where fragility fits into this picture of whiteness. But uh, let me ask you, Rob, uh, to state your questions. Thanks, Andrew, and thank you, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Crawford, as well. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So um, I was just also researching a bit of white, white fragility, and I know it, it speaks to actually um, um, similar to that keynote we had uh, from the American at, at conference around the inability or the triggers that these kinds of conversations have for, um, for, for white people um, with regards to white fragility is it's similar to having privileged conversations with people with privilege. They often don't want to have them because it means, um, you know, recognizing unfairness that exists. But I actually want to make a, 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 um, a comment or a question here. And this is, probably as clumsy as it gets. So colleagues, please don't cancel me and let's keep it psychologically safe. But I, um, I, I've been thinking a lot around language from this conversation. And there's a couple themes. One theme was when I was working with some clients at a major bank and the client said to me, you know, Rob, we can't have our township voices in the bank, you know? When we laugh, we have to laugh like white people, which was something that was so different in my world. Um, I've never thought there was a difference between laughing in different languages uh, or in different accents. And it was a very iron, very enlightening moment for me. And now a lot of my black friends make fun of me uh, quite often when, <laughs> when, when, when the topic comes up. They're like, yo, we're going to laugh like polite Rob. But um but with that being said, it, I looked at a few things and there's something to be said about, you know, having a white accent, even when people can speak English, they speak a different kind of English at home than they speak at the office mm -hmm. um, with a different kind of pronunciation. And mm -hmm. they have it in the US as well with North Americans. And um, I actually, I, I, I have a homosexual friend who's in the US and he even says to me, there's a gay accent as well. Um, and it makes me really, and then he even says to me, he's very successful in his career because he dials up his gayness when he's with women. He dials up his straightness or his masculinity when he's with men. So he says that, you know, just be homosexual. You'll climb the corporate ladder easy because you're not a threat to anyone. But um, that's neither here nor there. But I just, I, I think a lot around language and status, right? Because 
I'm, I've been dealing with some people in, in uh, Central Africa and there's often this bias when people can't speak English in a certain way that there's perhaps an unconscious perception of do they understand what's going, what's going on. And I wonder how much language plays out because the very last thing it makes me think about is I, I, I watched a, a film in the US where someone said, oh, that candidate speaks so well, but it was a black candidate. And they say, would you say that for a white person, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I wonder around the concept of language, of status, and perhaps social norming or conforming that happens. I think that's maybe my comments or question I'd like to reflect back. Over to you, Anne. <clears throat> okay, can you hear me or am I muted? No, no you're clear. Oh. Okay, is my is, is, is the presentation go off? Yes, I think it's off screen. Okay, Sorry, my screen has done something and I couldn't find how to do it. Um, okay, um, so, sorry, Robert, there, was, there were quite a few things that you said. I think the first one in terms of white fragility, I think there is a huge amount of, of concern around, around this. And I think um, that is why these conversations are so important um, because they, they, they're things that... <sighs> I mean, if we think about anybody who's been in a privileged position and you've got to face losing privilege, that is daunting um, because you have been in a place where you have, and obviously there are class differences, but where your life has been very easy. And now you have to be faced with normal life, if I can put that a normal life in inverted commas. Um, and, and so I think there is a huge amount of fear around this issue. Um, but, but I think that is why these conversations are so important because it's only as people start to recognize their privilege that they can start to do something about it. Um, and, and I think similar conversations are being had in the realm of gender. Um, there's, there's the whole issue of male fragility um, for the same reason. That, that the rise of feminism mm, and great point. women in, in organizations um, is threatening to men. Um, mm. So much so that my sister-in-law is, is a principal of a school, was a principal of a school, she's now in corporate structures, but they were having to introduce workshops for boys, you know, to help them deal with their, <laughs> their fragility. So yes, I think, and sorry, I'm, I'm being humorous about it, but I think that is the nature nature of it. But I think it's important that we, because, you know, once I started realizing my privilege, I, I, I've got two options. I can just ignore it, or if I truly believe and I realize it, I have to start acting in different ways, you know, and um, I, I can never do away with my white privilege because I wear it like a cloak. It's something I walk into a room that I can start to use it in different ways. I can start to, to promote change. I can start to say things. I can start to um, sort of shake the status quo a bit. So rather than resting on it, I can start to work to, towards changing it. Um, I think language is a huge issue. It's something that came out in, in my study in, in so many permutations. Um, I think the whole thing of, of accent, um, I saw it a lot with the accountants, for example, ended up leaving a lot of the corporate settings precisely because of accent, because you, you, it's very difficult to move up in the corporate structures simply because of your accent, because you don't sound the right way. Um, but I think those are the notions we have to start challenging. We have to start challenging this idea of um, what is white and, and what is the dominant way of speaking. Um, I think it, it, it applies, and I'm sorry, I'm going to use the terms colored and black and that because that is what, how people talk and, and that's what came out in my research is even for, for, for um, colored people who speak Afrikaans, having to switch to white Afrikaans. Um, and so, so the minute you move into a setting, one of the, the people shared how, um, and this is in a, in, a, in a university institution, how if he wants to get something done, 
he has to talk white Afrikaans. He can't mm -hmm. talk colored Afrikaans because if he talks colored Afrikaans, he's not taken seriously. And, and so this language <laughs> thing is huge. Sure. Um, and, and, and we have to recognize it and start looking at how we change it. Um, because if we think of language, and, and I think the other thing that, that about language that is, that is particularly challenging is that for many African people, Afrikaans is the, the language of the oppressor. And so when I talk Afrikaans in the present day, there's that sense of I'm bringing the oppression of the past into the present. Um, and, and, and so, yes, I think the language thing is enormous and we could probably spend a whole night on it. And it's, and it's for everybody that the different permutations of it um, are, are, you know, are present for everybody that, that way. Sorry, did I cover all your issues? Definitely. And uh, I was just commenting now to say a thank you that I didn't even pose a question. It's been a quite a long day. And thanks for the rambling. And thank you for the truly conversational tone of it. I think definitely, uh, you definitely did. And I'll just comment on one thing around Afrikaans is that if you just consider, you know, the 1976 Soweto uprising and our youth movement during apartheid, Afrikaans will always have baggage uh in this country and as an as a very proud english person as in i'm south african and i can't speak afrikaans uh growing up in kzn i i've really underestimated that a lot i only discovered that when i moved to johannesburg because it was never spoken outside of a classroom and it was never i wouldn't say weaponized but you know, that baggage and having an understanding of even today what you've said around a different accent of afrikaans versus um you know um, colored and white Afrikaans is also enlightening and an important discourse to have. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Rob. Uh, you can't say yeah, you have to say yeah. You know, that's how <laughs> we <can> say. <laughs> Listen, uh, I'm from fact, the last you know, outpost day. In case of then, we don't speak <laughs> yeah, anything else there. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely find it hilarious uh, coming from a small town where the kids nowadays, because the school obviously in town is of a better standard. And so a lot of parents send their kids now to the school out of the township, you know. And it's fascinating, even the kids that come from Lingalitle, which is the African township, and Bechosdal, which is the colored one, they invariably adopt that style of speaking Afrikaans. And and I used to listen to them and was absolutely fascinated. And, you know, it was hilarious to hear them speak. Then Afrikaans, Afrikaans, you know, with that accent. It was very funny to hear that. As you know, language in itself can become a big microaggression in itself, uh, where people uh, are, you know, expected to speak in a particular way, or even, uh, as we have said on, on other occasions, uh, you know, you would never ask a question of a white person or, or, or make a comment to a white person that you speak good English, yet we are quite happy to say that, uh, say to a black person, but we're not even aware of it, which is, I think, the bigger problem because you, you, you take it for granted the type of behavior that you exhibit under those particular circumstances. These people jump in. This is a conversation. What do you think? Uh, what's on your mind? Uh, let's hear it. If there are no other questions on language, I also just want to, um, I mean, other questions, I just want to make one more comment on language. I think what's so, what, what makes the language issue also so poignant is that language and identity are so closely linked. And that um, one of the ways I express myself is through, or I, one of the ways I express my identity is through language. Um, and so when, when there are issues around language and when my language is threatened, <clears throat> to portray in another way, if that makes sense. So I don't even have the privilege of portraying my identity, who I am, in the most natural way possible. Um, and that's almost like another um, 
uh, uh, oppression, if I can put it that way. And, and I think that's not only true for South Africa. I think we see that globally. So, for example, with English being a dominant language, the French struggle with the same issue. Um, so French academics, for example, having to write in English, um, struggle with this notion of, of having to um, they, they have a very particular way of thinking and, and formulating their thoughts, which is very um, bound up in their language. And when they have to write in another language, they, they really struggle because they can't express themselves in the same way. So I think the notion of language is, is a very central one in, in, in thinking about these issues from an identity perspective yeah. as well. And, and in fact, it's going to be one of our topics to talk about language within this broad scope of uh, racism and uh, the various aspects there of it. So uh, it is definitely something that we'll pick up uh, at, at some later date. Uh, Nwabisa, you say, you speak about code, switch, uh, code switching. Can, can you uh, um, explain that a little bit? What do you say? Thanks, Andrew. Um, that behavior that Rob was describing, um, they've actually got language for it that originated in the US. Um, and where it started was when there was integration in America um, and you had young black males walking around neighborhoods. Um, and in order to be seen as non-threatening, they started to wear very expensive sportswear, shoes. <laughs> they used to jog around um, to signal that they are not thugs and that they come from money and they belong in the neighborhood. Um, so, th so that's where code switching originated and it's, it was a survival tactic um, mm -hmm. in relation to being a minority in, in the mainstream. Um, and, and I think you know, what we're seeing sometimes in our communities and in corporate is, is a type of code switching because we're trying to adapt and adjust to the mainstream environment um, and to be non-threatening. Yes. It's, in it's fact, survival. As soon as, yeah. you, as soon as you step in in the morning, you have to leave behind culturally where you come from because you're stepping into a totally different world and having to be subjected to the rules and, you know, uh, of that particular environment. Yeah, I think a lot of people find that very difficult. And then the switch that you have to make in the evenings as you step out of that back into your own particular works, uh, 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 home spaces uh, uh, is, is quite an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, Joey, go for it. Uh, let's hear uh, hello, Mr. Johnson and everybody else on the call. Um, just before we left the language one, um, Dr. Anne and I did my dissertation on the professional identity of black rugby players in South Africa. And one of the key yeah. ways that we found whiteness to be um, portraying itself was through language um, in, in the, in the, as whiteness as an institution. And the, some of the language that the participants used is that when Afrikaans was used as the dominant language, um, things like I felt um, not part of the team, um, I felt like I didn't belong, I felt like as a passenger, I felt I was renting a space, not owning a space. So there's something powerful about language and belonging and a sense of belonging. So whether it's in the community or a team or a workspace, um, and I think it even speaks into uh, what the previous speaker spoke about. So in order for me to sort of assimilate and be that, I either have to learn to understand the language or speak into the language. Therefore, I can be accepted. And then I'd have to not speak the language to go out of it. So if I was not in the environment, I cannot speak Afrikaans, but I have to speak Afrikaans to assimilate myself into that space. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think the language, language is a massive one. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I just want to say, Joey, that uh, study that uh, you and Anne did on rugby players was absolutely fascinating. And I think uh, I made a comment, and unfortunately, I couldn't engage both of you because we ran out of time. It is a comment about such a major cultural kind of artifact of what whiteness was about rugby in South Africa in particular, and that the two of you tackle such a big topic, you know, because that is the one area you touch that, uh, just think back at the time of people wanting to change the Springbok emblem 
and uh, the uproar that caused that to give you an indication of just how deep uh, how deep that particular cult cultural artifact is ingrained in people's psyche in South Africa as an expression of whiteness. So fascinating study that you guys did. Thank you very much for that. Any comments on that, Anne, on what Joey said? Um, yes. Now, I think um, the, the, the other thing that that be is very important is the, the impact it has on professional identity. Because if I don't understand Afrikaans, and if, if we go and look at how professions or how people are socialized into professions, um, they, they, they are taken through the rhythms by somebody who knows. Now, if the person who's taking me through the rhythms is speaking a language I don't understand and continues to do so, which in, in some instances appear to be the case, um, the, the basic socialization processes are disrupted. The, the basic things that a young person coming into a profession is entitled to coaching um, they denied that because they don't understand the language um, and, and that is something that came through in my con in the context that I studied as well particularly in the engineering context where uh, uh, people would continue to talk Afrikaans and 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 um, young engineers coming in who don't understand Afrikaans um, lose a lot of valuable learning opportunities because conversations are happening and they're not part of those conversations. And so a lot of the socialization by osmosis, if I could put it that way, is lost because they simply don't have access to the conversation because of language. So yes, I think that is a very important one. Sure. No, thanks for, for that. I'm going to, I, I've noticed you, Veronica and uh, uh, Tashiana. Um, I just want to take Birgit because she's uh, away on a farm, she says, and in case we lose her. Are you able to just put your question to uh, Anne Birgit or what you have written in the box? You there? Okay, maybe, uh, Anne, I'll read it to you. Uh, she did say she's got some connection problems. Uh, great appreciation for our conversations, the safe space, creating this foundation for us. Uh, she's asking, practically speaking, what are we saying to one another? What are we proposing, suggesting the conversations look like if we talk about acting, behaving in different ways? Is there an ideal to strive for? What does it look like? How do we know when we have reached the ideal? Um, yeah, so that's basically a question, and you can also see it in the box, yeah. your comment. Okay, I, I think it, it probably gets, and if I'm understanding her correctly, I, I think it gets back to me, that to, to, to the difference between diversity and inclusion, that yeah. um, what, what we're really talking about is that uh, where whiteness is still dominating in any context, it's, it's about, we, we only get as far as saying we are creating diversity. So we can bring in people who look different, but they always remain on the margins. And we, there's the, 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 the dominant rhythms are still white, if I could put it that way. And, and by that, I mean all the things we've been talking about. Um, and, and I think the, the ideal to strive for is where we can truly talk about an inclusive environment, which means that I can talk and, and look, language is a sticky one because Obviously, it's very difficult to have an environment where everybody's talking 11 languages just from a, a practical point of view. But where I can talk English with my accent, whatever that sounds like, and it is equally acceptable to somebody speaking English like the Queen would. Um, yeah. And um, so, so I think that it, it, it really gets to creating an environment that is accepting of that diversity that includes the diversity and where we the the culture of the organization and the practices that are um around which the, the organization is structured are far more um open that they they reflect the diversity of our country that they divert, reflect the diversity of the cultures and you don't almost have 
this that everyone is trying to fit into one culture that we create a culture which accommodates everybody more comfortably and probably requires everybody to adapt so yeah. that as, as white people we have to start thinking of we also start have to, have to start adapting to different ways we can't always expect people to to adjust to to our ways of being and doing I I just want to, the question yeah hopefully it does unfortunately she has got connection so we can't even check in with her uh, interesting comment here from Lucy about black players tend to code switch also and try to speak English with an Afrikaans accent from what I've seen in varsity. That's a fascinating one, That's Lucy. I've never heard that one before about the English guys wanting to speak with an Afrikaans accent, you know, so uh, a very interesting one. Veronica, please go for it. Thanks, Andrew. I just wanted to weigh in regarding the language and how it's been weaponized, if I can say that. And I think in South Africa and possibly globally, English is not just seen as a language, it's seen as a measure of one's intelligence. Yeah. And I think um, I speak for myself, you know, I started work in the early 80s, I'm dating myself now. And I had to assimilate for survival, safety, and access. And the easiest way then was to make sure, and my dad would make sure that we pronounced our words properly because we were invisible. And that would have just by chance made a white person notice us and gain us, give us access to get work. So I think that's still very much the case because I think Anne has mentioned that we speak about organizations culture, but that culture is still informed by the dominant white culture. And I think even when our kids go to private schools, the way whiteness is marketed as being the standard of intelligence, of beauty, of sophistication, of education, the holders and the creators of knowledge. There is that unconsciousness where that white proximity still, I think, informs people's need to assimilate for safety, survival, and access. And that sadly is still prevalent in corporate South Africa still to today. Thank you. Thanks, Veronica. <clears throat> yeah, I think the issue of language, and just jump in if you want to. The, the issue of language is such a critical thing about either, you know, creating the sense of uh, inclusion or exclusion. And we know that a lot about, you know, in the past, how people used to talk about uh, Black people sitting in a meeting and uh, conversation ensue amongst people in Afrikaans you know, and people feeling excluded um, uh, in that particular instance and taken for granted that it's okay to do that. Uh, you know, again, this problem about how the mental model get fixed in your head and you don't see it any longer, but it continues to pull the strings as to how you behave. Uh, thanks for that, Veronica. Anything from you, Anne? No, no, nothing. That's, I, I don't, I think the ones, and it's not only corporate South Africa, it's, it's pretty much, <laughs> it's mm. acad academic institutions, right. it's, it's sport, it, it goes so much further than, than that, yeah. yeah. Sure, yeah. sure, thanks, Anne. Thanks, uh, Veronica. Tashiana, go for it. Thanks, Andrew. I know we've spoken a lot around... Um... Uh, you're a little bit soft, you'll just have to speak up a bit more. Can you hear me now? No. Can you hear me now? Uh, maybe if you take your, your headphones off, I think sometimes they create that problem. Can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Yeah, there you are. There you are. So I just wanted to, I know we've spoken a lot around um, language and whiteness, but I just wanted to add another dimension to the conversation around physical appearance. 
And this was just an experience that I had a few years ago where um, we were looking at promoting two individuals into the C-suite. So the one gentleman was black and the other one was, the other lady was colored. And they basically had to have um, conversations around the physical appearance and how the appearance needed to change to sort of align to the traditionally white appearance, if I can use that terminology. So the, the black gentleman used to wear dreadlocks and that was his way of controlling his hair and maintaining his physical appearance. And that was regarded as a no-no in the organization. So he obviously had to change his appearance in order to qualify for the executive appointment. And the same thing for the colored lady where she didn't have, uh, she had naturally curly hair and um, she was told that she had to invest in a, um, what do you call it, the flat iron. And, um, you know, her <laughs> comment was, I can't, I can't afford a, a GHD. Um, that, that at the time she said, I can't afford a GHD. That is a lot of money. Um, but, you know, this is an issue. I'm going to have to make the investment because I want the promotion into the, into the C-suite. And, you know, that's just um, dawned on me around how the, the white appearance, physical appearance dominates um, corporate culture in terms of this is what is regarded as acceptable dress code and physical appearance in order for you to get the promotion. Thanks, Andrew. Absolutely. And thank, thanks for that, Tashiana. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I think it's it's actually very scary that that there is that kind of pressure put on people, and and I think just the complete recognition, uh, complete lack of recognition of the social construction that underlies that particular way of of being and doing, and that that is never raised, that is never questioned, it's never brought under the microscope as to, and I mean, I mean, it, it even it gets so humorous if you go and think of corporate South Africa. Um, we, we, we follow ways of dressing that are very appropriate overseas. But if we think of the heat in South Africa and, and was it, what is expected of people to wear suits, of guys generally, um, suits and ties. I mean, question people complain all the time but yet in many corporate settings that is still the order of the day and it's yeah. it's never questioned it's never challenged it's never and and that is where international whiteness comes in so and 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 we see it particularly in the accounting firms where a lot of the firms are global firms so you are dealing it's not just a south african firm you're dealing with with a, a, a multinational um, and so you, you have a lot of the pressure coming in from globally in terms of what professionalism looks like. So, yeah. so professionalism is performative. It, it is done. It's not just something you are. It's performed. And, and in order to perform that, you have to meet certain criteria. But, but I think what's, what's sad is that those things are never challenged. Um, that, that the questions are never asked. What makes it possible that in a country um, in the global south where we have very different climate, that we continue to take standards, um, and, and I'm, I'm making this general um, because I think that's where it starts. It impacts everybody, um, but, but we need to to start asking questions around what makes it possible that we are forced to fit this mold? Why are there not other ways of being and doing? Why can we not um, look at professionalism and redefine it in, in output rather than in terms of a, a physical appearance? Um, and, and I think those are the kind of conversations that, that we have to start having. Um, and, and I think, um, Tashiana, to, to get to your point of the, the, the lady saying, you know, I simply don't have money. I think if, if we go and look at a lot of the, the young um, accounting um, 
people going or, or, or graduates moving into accounting they have to they come from very disadvantaged backgrounds and they're forced to to dress in what people consider a professional style which and already they at and, and this speaks to the the disadvantaged side the lack of privilege so the wide setting is structured around um privilege and that's where we see the privilege coming through that people coming from disadvantaged backgrounds um are forced to fit in with a particular lifestyle and a way of looking which is based on privilege and not disadvantage and so they are further disadvantaged um and they're already trying to catch up in terms of buying a car because you you, you can't be an accountant without a car taxis and and so so suddenly you have this additional pressure not only do you have to adjust to this white culture but there is this drain on your financial resources in order to fit in um and so it almost becomes a double um a double whammy for people like that is that you're disadvantaged in just multiple ways so i think that's a very important point in, in fact, uh, I, I think that's exactly what we're talking about. This taken for grantedness, which is what whiteness is about, is what we mean when we say it is the room because you're no longer looking at the walls. You are actually just operating inside the room. And, you, and one of the ways, which is one of my <clears throat> pet topics, is to say that one of the ways in which we are going to begin to raise consciousness about it is to name the thing. Because as soon as you name it, you are able to lift it out of this kind of unconscious or tacit kind of space in which it operates and how it be continues to impact not only the white people as to how they step up, but black people, because it's taken for granted that that is what for example, professionalism is about. And there's not even a question mark unless you are very conscious about it and actually step back and ask the question about it. That is exactly how whiteness had become then that um, the room itself and not just the elephant. Uh, Joey, go for it. Um, yeah, so I think um, I was just thinking now when we were chatting about so whether you look at it from a language perspective, a looks perspective, a professionalism perspective, one of the definitions that for me just stuck with me about whiteness was that we're taking a white standard and we're judging everybody according to that. Um, so mm -hmm. I've got two little girls and we often buy them black dolls and the idea is for them to say that is beautiful. Um, so because in the past, you've got black little girls playing with white, blonde, straight haired dolls. So for them, beauty can never be anything but that. So I think for me, because I'm solutions based in my head, that's what my job is about, is that I'm feeling the pressure as a, let's say, a leader in my field to what, define what a successful black coach looks like and and go according to that and not fight for what is the western standard what success should look like but it's for me to in my joeyness in my blackness to do that uh, yeah i hope I, I hope i'm making sense i'm just saying that it's it's we have to find another way you've got to build another table because the current table is not one that acknowledges those things um in a way that's useful for anybody that's not white in those spaces i hope that makes sense it is very much about building the consciousness, both on the side of when we talk about whiteness and its pervasive nature within society, it then becomes not just a problem for white people, it becomes a problem for black people because unconsciously, and we will be talking about the topic of internalized black oppression, how we have made those things as part of ourselves and take it for granted that it is normal. And that is part of the problem of uh, what we are talking about here. A uh, comment from you, uh, Anne? Yeah, um, no, I, I, I don't have much more to, to add on that. Sorry, I was just busy looking at the, the comments. Um, and yeah. um, Birgit asked, have, are we aware of success stories of inclusivity? And when I first looked at that, I... Um, I, I'm, I wasn't very optimistic, but, but I see Sharon has said that 
from places where I've seen inclusive behavior being spoken and experienced, it's been done with intentionality, especially by the leadership, not being afraid to call out problematic behaviors. And I, I think that is, is very, very important because in, in, in one of the, the, the contexts that we were really So in which people were just talking Afrikaans and leadership actually asked that, it, you know, brought the attention to, to um, people and said, please can um, meetings be held in English? And, and it was just blatantly ignored and, and nothing was ever done about it. Um, so, so I think it, it is absolutely, it has to come from leadership. Um, and, and I'm glad to hear, Sharon, that they are... Um, places where that, that, that people... But, but Sharon will have to be a bit more concrete about it because I have not seen it yet. So Sharon, <laughs> tell us about these places where it has worked. <laughs> and uh, oh, Andrew, <laughs> my network is dropping. But look, I think it's in small teams and then we need, we need to upscale. So it would be in a section, yeah. um, you know, like in one of the banks where you know the commitment is there from the leadership team to say this is what we're doing so NetBank has been good around that whether it's experienced right across um, I'm not sure but what I have seen is where the leadership team is saying look this agenda matters it makes sense it improves our bottom line we speak about it we're not afraid to call it out you actually see a shift because we need to use our rank in which spaces we find ourselves otherwise you know it's, we're just blowing a lot of steam and nothing actually shifts so right. when someone makes a comment mm -hmm. that's problematic you call it out and say well no actually or dress code like now with covid disrupting us in hybrid work how does my wearing a suit you know correlate with my ability to deliver am i yeah. not able to just do the work without looking you know a particular way so I think this is interesting and lots of caveats and it's work that we must all continue to do. You're right. Thanks, Sharon. Louise, you made the comment about the golfing metaphor. Do you want to talk to that quickly? Sure. It's, it's actually um, more in the informal NGO structures that I've come across it, but it was just more to do with professionalism. So within these couple of, let's say, client organizations, they were using the golfing metaphor to say, you know what, in order to be this professional, which is this person talking English in a proper way, literally horrible use of language. But anyway, um, the golfing metaphor was, you know what, in order to play golf, you need to, you know, abide by the rules of golf. You need to wear the clothes in order to play the sport. So essentially for you to become a part of the game, you need to, dress a certain way, talk a certain way, follow the rules. And that was just the kind of <laughs> horrific conversation that I was exposed to. But I will also say that the unfortunate thing is sometimes, and this is where I agree with Sharon, where you have to use your power, right? You need to understand, well, why are you bearing witness to this conversation? And that's the thing that always gets me thinking. Why, why is it assumed that it's okay to have this conversation with me in the room? yeah and yeah. what what can i do about that yeah right. I, and i'm not sure whether i'm the narrator of the inclusivity part i don't think i can narrate that i think yeah. i can narrate the experience that i've witnessed possibly how i acted but not whether or not the let's say the end game of that conversation was turned around into inclusivity. I, just to mention earlier in the comment about, can we tell stories about inclusivity? I'm not sure if my position allows me actually to even articulate inclusivity because I'm part of the room. But yeah, yeah that's just the uh, observation. No, thanks, thanks for that. Um, just Sharon's comment. For many of us, the luxury of oblivion keeps us stuck. We find it easier to be silent, yet our voice will air to critical mass and change how things are on spaces we find ourselves in. In fact, white, whiteness is space of taking up space. We need to restrict the space that whiteness is taking up. Uh, colleagues, are there any other 
comments or questions. Otherwise, I will ask Anne to give a summation of our conversation. And uh, in the nature of this, not with finality, but rather to say, let's talk some more about it. Here are some ideas. Let's talk some more. We want to understand because the better informed we are, the better we can tackle the issues and big ones that sit in front of us. Over to you, Anne, unless there's anybody who wants to make a comment. Uh, but go for it, uh, Anne. Okay. Um, I, I think I just want to pick up quickly on, on what, what Louise said in that last one is just about, um, she, she was very honest there. And I, I think these conversations, it, it's something I grapple with every day. Um, that sense of how do I as a white person use my privilege and, mm -hmm. and, and being part of conversations. Um, she says, you know, wh why are you, what makes you think I'm comfortable with that um, conversation happening in the room? And I, I think those are the kind of things we as white people have to ask ourselves, <clears throat> um, really interrogate, um, interrogate um, our, our hearts and say, you know, where do we stand on this and how do we work to to change it um then I, I, but but in 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 summation i think um what's important to realize is that whiteness is structural and that it's spatial and because it's structural it gives one gives white people privilege that they simply can be unaware of. And, and the, the scary thing about the structural nature of it is that it reproduces itself um, unless it is deliberately changed. And, and I think we, we've, we've highlighted a lot of those areas, the language, the issue of, of the dolls, the standards of beauty, the culture um, of organizations just being reproduced. Um, but I think the other thing we have to take seriously is that that whiteness is spatial and and for that reason it is quite literally the theory of the room and, and that's why when you use that quote Andrew it's sort of like just jumped out for me I just thought yeah it is quite literally the theory of the room um, and and I think it's unfortunately, I mean, it's wonderful that we have this group of people, but and I wish there could be more people. I, I, I just I wish that um, we could have more people who take this seriously. Um, but I, I really hope that as we start to have these clumsy conversations and that as we go from here, um, as, as all the, the variety of our rainbow nation, that each of us start to, to think about things in different ways, that we start to challenge things that have come to be normal and assumed to be normal and, and the, the domain of some and, um, and really start to ask difficult questions as well, um, to, to turn our own thinking over. And, and to challenge it um, and to look at what has become normal and how did that become socially constructed? And if it has been socially constructed, it can be reconstructed. Um, and then looking at ways of creating those truly inclusive spaces that we've, that we've sort of alluded to and that Sharon us do exist <laughs> in, yeah. in small enclaves um, and we just trust that those can be expanded um, to, to include truly inclusive workplaces. But thanks to everyone who was here. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation and I really appreciate all the involvement. Thanks Anne for that and uh, I think that last point needs to be reiterated. The very fact that a lot of these things are socially constructed means we can also make choices to change it because it's not it's not cast in stone. Yeah. It's uh, the effort that we're going to put to it that will make it different uh, to be able to create new constructions about these things that are so pernicious within society. Colleagues, that's our conversation for today. Uh, as you see, it's not intended to hold it and to say this is all of it. We have uh, only opened up a little bit more conversation uh, on uh, uh, the topics that we will be tackling. 
And the corollary of this one, whiteness, is black internalized oppression, which is our next topic, because we want to explore this particular area a little bit more in depth to understand how has it become, not because it's an inherent quality, but how whiteness has created because of its dominance, how it has created this internalized oppression for people. And how do we begin to become conscious of it and then to fight like with all of these other things against it. That topic will be addressed in a month's time. So we'll be back in a month's time. We will inform you by Ruwain Cock and looking forward to seeing you and bringing a friend or two friends with you to our conversation. So please, uh, I don't want to see you here alone, Joey. I want to see you with two other people. So guys, uh, that's your task for your homework for the next month. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all again. And thank you very much for uh, your input and Anne for leading us on that conversation. Uh, good evening to all of your colleagues. Thank you, Anne.